In order to truly understand what happened on September the 11th and the close relationship between the Bushes, the Bin Ladens, and the rest of the Saudi elite, you have to go back about 25 years and south a couple of thousand kilometers to Houston, Texas, where in the mid-1970s, George W. Bush was a young man just trying to learn the ropes in his family's two businesses, politics and oil. George Sr. struck it rich in oil, became a congressman, then director of the Central Intelligence Agency, where it's said he first won the friendship of the Saudi royal family by arranging CIA training for their palace guards. And George Jr. was trying to follow in his father's footsteps. A Harvard business grad, he dabbled in politics and the Texas Air National Guard. And it was about the same time that a man named Bill White, a former fighter pilot with a Harvard MBA himself, was recruited to work in Houston with someone with business and personal connections to both George Bushes. His name was Jim Bath. This fellow James R. Bath needed someone to run a series of real estate companies that would be um, grub staked by not only the political families but also by some foreign nationals, the Saudis. And so I came down on an interview and met Jim. They opened an office in downtown Houston where Bill White became Jim Bath's partner and confidant. But White says Bath spent most of his time dealing with his foreign partners, a wealthy Saudi family, the Bin Ladens. He also ran a company in the same building called Bin Laden and Associates, which Jim explained was a procurement company for the Saudis. He bought a bank for them. He bought an airport for them. He started an airline for them, among other ventures in Houston, Texas. Now, at that point, had you ever heard the name Bin Laden? No, I had not. meant nothing to you? It meant nothing to me. But in Saudi Arabia, the Bin Laden's name meant a great deal indeed. They owned one of the largest Saudi construction companies. They were advisors to the royal family. They were the second richest family next to the royals, with billions of dollars to invest abroad in places like Houston, where the Bush family lived. They moved into this estate in one of Houston's finest neighborhoods. A Bin Laden brother named Salam Bin Laden and a brother-in-law, Khalid Bin Mafus. Mafus was also one of the Saudi royal family's bankers. So is it fair to say that when the Bin Laden group establishes an office in Houston, the presence of the Bush family at that point had a lot to do with it? Oh, absolutely. I think that was essential, the essential element. I don't think any of those dollars would have come into the United States or any of those assets been purchased had not there been this quid pro quo relationship with the, with the Bush family. While the Bin Ladens built their ties to Texas, back home in Saudi Arabia, they were making another kind of foreign investment. In 1979, the Soviet Union occupied Afghanistan. The Saudi royal family wanted to build a Muslim army known as the Mujahideen to defend Islam and force the Russians out. They turned to their trusted advisors, the Bin Ladens, who offered up a lanky 21-year-old named Osama. The man who personally chose Osama bin Laden to build that army would also become his mentor, Saudi Prince Turki Al Faisal. Last year on British television, he reminisced about the young bin Laden. In those days, he was uh, a young man who had uh, committed himself to helping the Afghan Mujahideen uh, liberate themselves from the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan and uh, he was doing a lot of good. Uh, he was uh, bringing uh, support and aid to the Mujahideen. Meanwhile, back in Houston, the Bush family was also on the move. George Sr. was about to become vice president, and his son made a career decision too. By the late 70s, George W. Bush was setting out on his own. He established an oil exploration company that he called Arbusto. A Spanish word that loosely translated means bush. But before Arbusto could find oil, it needed to find some money, operating capital. And apparently George Bush knew where to look. Well, Bath had told me that he had used Saudi money to fund George Bush Jr.'s foray into the energy business. This is the Arbusto Corporation? Yes, the Arbusto Partnerships. As Bath's partner, Bill White, says he had access to information about the financial dealings between the Bin Laden family and George W. Bush. 
He later obtained Bath's personal financial statements when the two had a falling out and became involved in litigation. On schedules that show his partnership interests, he shows a personal partnership interest of $25,000 invested in Arbusto 79 and another $25,000 investment in, in Bush 80. But according to White, that share was only Bath's commission for investing the bin Laden's money with Bush. Do you have any knowledge of how much money the Saudis put in? Well, he told me it was in excess of, you know, a million dollars. So there's no question in your mind whatsoever that whatever went into George W. Bush's companies from Jim Bath was money well, from the Saudis? One hundred percent of it was Saudi money. And George W. Bush would have been aware of that? Oh, absolutely. But that wasn't all. A few years later, another oil company in which George W. Bush was involved needed cash. It got a reported $25 million, again, thanks in part to Bush's old Houston neighbor, Khalid bin Mafus, Osama bin Laden's brother-in-law. And it wasn't only George Bush the son who benefited. The bin Ladens did business with the Houston bank where George Bush Sr. was on the board. What time is it? Victory, Victory time. time. <laughs> this is the non-political part of this. Come on. And businessman Bill White says whether Bush Sr. knew it or not, the Bin Ladens were also generous with him when he ran for president in 1988, allegedly finding a way around the U.S. ban on foreign campaign contributions. My understanding from Bath was that they were making campaign contributions by taking briefcases full of cash to the law firms. They would give the cash to the lawyers, and each of the lawyers in turn would make a $1,000 campaign contribution to Bush. Which would presumably be against electoral law in the U.S. Well, it is against the law, but it's obviously covered by virtue of the attorneys making the contributions. And when George Bush Sr. became president, as with George W. more than a decade later, the Saudis occupied a special place at the White House. The Oval Office always opened to one man, Saudi Arabia's ambassador, Prince Bandar. He's got instant access. He calls him up, says, I'm coming over. He's got instant access to the CIA, anybody he wants. He can summon people. He can call anybody up at home at any time, which most ambassadors in Washington cannot do. Robert Baer served with the CIA for 21 years and spent much of that time in the Middle East. What is the George W. Bush calls Bondar? Bondar Bush? Bondar Bush, yeah, he calls him Bondar Bush. You know, that's fine. Bondar's a great ambassador. It works great until you turn a blind eye, until you believe everything Bondar says. Baer believes that Bondar's position is symptomatic of the blind self-interest on both sides. That's the Saudi-American relationship's fatal flaw. It's a lesson George W. Bush and his administration wouldn't learn until it was much too late. Had Saudi Arabia been acting as one might expect a true ally and friend to act, could they have told the U.S. all they needed to know about the real threat posed by bin Laden? They knew everything. They were the source of fundings that went to, to buy arms, to buy bombs through their charities. And those charities in Saudi Arabia are all controlled by the government to some extent. It was 1991. The Gulf War was over. American troops had defended Saudi oil fields against Saddam Hussein. Now the U.S. could continue to enjoy the economic security which came with all that Saudi oil. It was essentially the same deal George W. Bush himself made when he did business with the Bin Ladens in Houston. One side got a powerful partner, the other oil and money. Former CIA agent Robert Baer. The United States depends upon Saudi Arabia for its oil production. Uh, Saudi Arabia also recycles all the money it makes off oil in the United States and puts trillions of dollars in our banks, it pays for presidential libraries, anything you can imagine. And the Clinton White House wasn't immune to Saudi charm either. It was difficult not to give the benefit of the doubt to the biggest buyer of American military hardware with the deepest pockets in the stock market, not to mention the world's largest oil reserves. Which is why after George Bush Sr. left office and became a senior advisor to the powerful international investment firm, the Carlyle Group, he paid a number of visits on their behalf to his good friends, the Saudi royal family and the Bin Laden. A very nice reunion with friends. I'm very pleased to be here. They soon became Carlyle clients. 
Incredibly, on September 11th, Bush and the head of the Bin Laden family would be at the same Carlyle Group meeting in Washington, just a few miles from where Osama Bin Laden's hijackers would attack the Pentagon.